woke up in love this morning. I woke up in love this morning. Went to sleep with you on my mind. Is the TV on? No. I woke up in love this morning. I woke up in love this morning. Went to sleep with you on my mind. We have 5K, y'all. Welcome back to my channel. It's Tyra here with another struggle review here to discuss Crooklyn. Now this movie is from 1994 and it stars Alfred Woodard and Dale Boy Lindo. Now before I get into all things Boy Troy, I need you guys to drop down and subscribe to my channel and like this video. I'm going to give you guys a moment to do that and then we're going to come back and discuss all things. Let's to me la 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 means i love you oh baby baby go back 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 guys have hopefully subscribed to see more of me let's get into this movie now this film is very much so a semi-autobiography for not only spike lee but his siblings as well we get into his childhood as far as his upbringing his parents the love of music that 70s era which would explain why this movie feels very personal and you get a sense of home as soon as the movie starts spike lee's character is very much so quentin you know that strong love for basketball rooting for those Knicks. Troy is very much so Joy Lee, that middle child, that only girl raised up with all boys and their mother did eventually pass away from cancer. But unlike the movie, Spike Lee was well off into his college years. Now this movie has went on to achieve cult classic like status but believe it or not at the time of its release it was not commercially successful and was considered to be Spike Lee's first real flop after movies like Malcolm X do the right thing and jungle fever and after this film we had clockers and girl six that were also not successful oh they went outside for clockers and girl six <laughs> what was going on. Now immediately the tone is set with the beautiful well-known direction from Spike Lee and the principal photography cinematography this is here being done by Arthur Fielder aka the same guy who did it for Daughters of Dust aka the guy that's still touching on shit now like cranes in the sky and don't touch my hair. The tone is set with that in the music. You get into this vibrant sense of sex the sense of innocence and the essence of what it feels like to be in a time that is just long forgotten. The simplicity of playing games in the street on a hot summer day, jumping rope, board games, ice cream, bicycles, stickball. Trash men didn't get the trash today. Do, 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 do. Oh, why? Because there were more pay. It gets real, it gets immediately with the stylistics or you know my hood ass i'm getting dizzy as the world keeps spinning like a frisbee gangsters say girls make the world feel so hesitation i can run a nation from incarceration seven years is what i'm facing but give me seven seeds in the left g okay i'm sorry gangsters make the world 
go right. West side is the best side. Okay. That's the movie. Every time you watch this film, depending on what age you are, you get into a time machine and you feel like you're in a space that doesn't exist anymore or a space that you wish you were a part of. There is such a sense of family and you immediately feel really connected to all of these people through the family dinners, the hardworking parents, and that strong black mother who just has one request, clean up the damn kitchen before I get home from work. All of us have had that experience that you better have this kitchen clean before I get home and getting woken up out of your funky ass sleep because you didn't. That one sibling who wants to wash their one fork, their one plate, and their one cup. That one sibling who's the oldest and who's getting really, really tall and trying to try mama. That other sibling who just has to be the dry ass snitch. I'd rather have a father than a mother any day. What? What'd you say? Nothing. He said he'd rather have a father than a mother any day. Like, who, who, who told you to do that? <laughs> Everything here feels really close and really familiar and makes you long for a time when your biggest frustration and worries were as a kid, making sure the kitchen was clean and your mother threatening your life. Look at me when I'm talking to you. I am one of your little friends. I'll knock your ass in the middle of next week. I'll slap the black off of you. Ugh, oh, no more of that. Now we're the ones trying to slap the black off of somebody. Old. Now speaking of mothers, we get into eat the peas. All the peas on the plate. Play the scales, Bleak. We get into eating the goddamn peas. And we get into Afri Wooda here playing that strong mother. She's a black teacher. She's very much so the disciplinarian in the house, the enforcer, you know, coming through with that strictness. And then we get into Delroy Lindo, the dad, you know, coming in, you know, with the juice and the sand cake. He's more lenient. He's cool and calm. He's a jazz musician and he just wants to play his authentic music. But right away, you see very very much so that the family and the kids do not appreciate their mother as much as they should. And we are all probably guilty of that. You uh, really get a sense of not valuing something until it's gone while watching this film. And them, especially the oldest, Quentin, seeing the mom as, you know, oh, she's so strict, she's more of a tyrant when she's really giving you the necessities of life. If I could, I'd like to be a great big movie star. Over nice and <laughs> Now we drive a big. We do not just stay within the home of the family. We venture outside often and we flesh out the movie in the characters within this film with people like Vic, you know, our Isaiah Washington, this vet who lives in the brownstone also. And we get into Tommy, the older boy who likes to sing on the stoop. We get into the neighborhood girls, you know, Troy's friends. The almost sometimes don't you me ugly. I hate you, Minnie. Get off my stoop. You think you're so pretty. She got Puerto Rican hair. Like, you know, we get into all the girls, you know, the loco bodega, the friends, the loud, stinky neighbor. They really go in on making sure you understand what the essence was like for 70s in that Brooklyn, Crooklyn ass brownstone area. Even with the little derogatory racist terms that we get a little bit along the way, this is a Spike Lee film. It is 1994 and it is set in the 70s, so it is to be expected. I wasn't worried about that. I was too busy appreciating the little things, like the kids around the neighborhood making fun of Troy's hair along with her mother's. And it is so beautiful and so appreciated. Even came back into the now and is now in style. Whoever was doing Afri Wood's hair in in the film, oh, gorgeous. The beads are gorgeous. Or even things like Troy trying to navigate, you know, with her first first crush, picking on her and following her around the neighborhood. Or the kids being secure enough in their own neighborhood to just go off and play. Even the journey that we get to go on with Troy. Now, this is about the entire family, but we get the closest connection and we spend the most time with Troy because this is her coming of age story. Just her being able to find herself and her being a little rough around the edges and really rugged and strong because she is the only girl in the family and she's a tone boy at this point. We don't even get that anymore. It's a crime to be a tone boy. You don't even get to be a tone boy now. You get to be
Troy is allowed to grow and discover herself, not only in, but outside of Brooklyn eventually as a young lady and even with or without her mother. Now you also spend an awful lot of time singing, bopping, and grooving via this movie just because Spike Lee decided to slap on the soundtrack and add the essence of the 70s here. We get all the way like a fool I went and stayed too long. We get all the Stevie Wonder. You know, we get the past the peas like we used to say. Past the peas like you break it down. Last Stone, get that Curtis Mayfield, and even the standalone song. <sighs> don't, don't get me crickling Dodgers up in here. Now it's only get worse. Buckshot and aced in the land of the waste. Kicking when you face, we be doing it up Brooklyn style. What does it take to get you wow, wow? My mentality is getting illa, killer. Instincts to try to infiltrate, but wait. I know you want to enter, but I can't let you in. But my mind stays the maddest, I'm going with the wind. Because it is survival of the fittest. When the shit hits the fan, I got my shank in my hand. Black man with the permanent tan. I come from the villa, never ran. Damn. Ow! Okay, okay. It's all right. Y'all always distracting me. Oh, why? Oh, why? Ain't no smiling faces. I'll take you there. Let's get into this dramatic ass fight on the stairs. <laughs> I don't know why when I think about Crooklyn, their aesthetic as a married couple, I completely push that to the side. I'm all, I woke up in love this morning. You know, you think about the things that you love most about the film and not the main ingredients of the film, like their marriage. Woody as a husband here was coming off so irresponsible and so selfish. I don't know why and how I missed it before, maybe because these things look a little too familiar, but you literally have the mother here taking on the burden to handle every single thing. Not only take care of their five children, but pay all the bills and also work, cook dinner, clean, and all I'm asking for is a little help and stability that she is not getting from Woody. She is trying to be supportive but she is a little aggy because she is exhausted but he is also demanding and feeling like he's in his own right because he wants to have his alone time to be a pure musician and write and you know illustrate things and it's just I can't even take a piss without five kids hanging off of my freaking tits meanwhile you're going on and on about how you can't have any peace and quiet and how nobody's respecting your vision for your music, which is all great and fabulous, but it's not bringing any money into the household. Meanwhile, you cop an attitude because I want you to write down what you spent and when you spent it and how you spent it, what you spent it on because I'm trying to balance this checkbook and you being an asshole about it. Like, it completely went all the way over my head. You know, him dealing with his little dry ass concert, this entire movie that didn't bring a dime <laughs> into the house that was not successful and everybody having to bear the burden for him to be a pure musician. I was like, what kind of shit? What is this? We have to bite the bullet and have you leave to be the pure musician? Meanwhile, we can keep the lights on? No! I was so annoyed with Woody. At some point, as a responsible adult slash husband slash father, you need to be able to do things simultaneously. You better be doing something to where you can bring some type of money in this house and still be this pure-blooded musician. To my Judy, play the scales. Get, 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 get the hell out of my face. I'll take. That's what you. I should have known. How could I ever miss it? You know how fed up you have to be as a married woman to tell your husband of your five kids 
pack your shit and tell your brother to come get your shit. Get the hell out of my house. Now, getting further into the film, I realized why we could have missed pivotal moments like this because we have so many other things going on in the film that are not pushing any narratives along. Now, I love me some Spike Lee, but y'all know he is good for a moment and sending us on an acid trip. Now, we may not remember those moments because we're too busy. I never go back to Georgia. Da -na -na -na. I never go back to Georgia. Punta, I ain't no punta. I'm Connie. I keeps my panty clean, which we absolutely love, you know, RuPaul and the whole nine, but that really distracted and didn't really serve a purpose in the story. Even when we have moments like, you know, the bad thick, punching out, you know, the neighbor and getting arrested. Hey, Joe, they love to put some, put some goddamn Jimi Hendrix on some vets. Hey, Joe, soon as a veteran pop out, Vigna, where you go with that gun? Like, ain't, no, ain't nobody asked y'all for that. <laughs> or, you know, snuff running around trying to rob somebody or even, you know, Troy having moments of waking up and urinating on in the middle of the floor or her having fever dreams about snuff chasing her to sniff some glue. Like, it's all, you know, kind of spacey and really feels out of place when we get into the things that we really needed to stick to in the film. I was very fine with, you know, the simplistic stuff of them just watching TV and, you know, Quentin having his obsession with the Knicks and sports in general. Even simplistic stuff like Troy going in the store, you know, let me get five bazookas, 10 fireballs, eight Boston beans. Like, I love that type of stuff. Or just the dynamic of that sibling robbery, Troy stealing his nickels, them, you know, nitpicking, picking on each other, Quentin trying his mother, and the dynamic of their marriage as a whole. Both of the spouses not feeling supported. Hell, Troy not wanting to go to the store with them old school food stamps. You know them old food stamps that look like foreign ass currency. <laughs> now, mama say, mama sa, mama kusa. You know, you let Peanut take my food stamps and my money. Like, you know, those moments, I absolutely love those moments but I feel like we were so distracted with the atmosphere and the music we didn't even realize the reason for Troy going to stay with Aunt Song or the boys going to stay elsewhere was because they were younger and the family was financially strapped and couldn't get the lights back on for a minute we even you know miss moments of the family really relying on his older brother you know to help with things financially it, it, it was a lot going on but we were so Roll on, roll on, on, on. We were rolling on because the lights were off. Oh, but once we get to Aunt Song's house, you know that bougie relative that got a little coin who made it out the hood? One, two, three, the devil's after me. Four, five, six, he's always throwing sticks. Seven, eight, nine, he misses every time. Hallelujah, 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 amen. <laughs> Now, it is absolutely sad because this is a wonderful movie in its own right, but nothing gets remembered like the trip to Aunt Song's house. Aunt Song is different. First of all, the whole visual aesthetic of the camera elongates. Why? Because Spike can once we get to Aunt Sarah's. Now we see very much so that Troy is very much hesitant to go. She's never been out of Brooklyn, never been away from her family, but her mom tells us that it's good for her and we very much see that it is. She begins to grow. There's an older, another girl there. Viola, step back white boy, you don't shine. I put the color boy to kick you behind. You know, they was having a good ass time, but Outside of all of that, that whole plot point of the story gets thrown out the way because Queenie decides to die. I just want to know who the fuck put Queenie in that sofa. Queenie didn't get in there, fold out by herself. <laughs> Troy is embracing being there. You know, she's writing the family. She is missing them, but she is embracing what the neighborhood has to offer. It is her birthday. She's been sent earrings, and she even gets to have a nice little sleepover via Aunt Song 
who you know has already gave it that good old hot comb energy oh your clothes not nice like my baby's viola you can't wear these you know our song is very much so bougie but she is loving and you see troy begin to grow now during this birthday party queenie decides to hide an aunt song is looking for her queenie 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 oh lord where's my child queenie <laughs> queenie somehow i low-key always felt like troy put queenie's ass in there because troy was not fucking with queenie queenie winds up in the sofa and she pops out like a fucking jack in the box and aunt song has a goddamn meltdown Oh God, oh God, oh God. Like, oh, it is so memorable and so funny when it's not supposed to be. But that, yet again, is one of the things, you know, when we get into Spike Lee's films, that it's just like, doesn't quite belong. It is quite extra, it is quite jarring from where we were going in the film. But it's memorable and it's funny when Queenie fucking dies. I never can say goodbye. No, 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 no. I never can say goodbye. Once we have Troy return back to Brooklyn, everything is changed forever. And I really hated to see the story end off like this. It is quite sad. Her mother does have cancer and she is dying and it changes the family forever. Now, Watching this recently, I really wish we would have just solely focused on the family dynamic and them really embracing their mother or lack thereof because like anybody else, we don't really appreciate someone or what they brought to us until they're gone. So if we could have spent more time with the family instead of being outside of the home so much in the community or even shit at Aunt Song's house, I really even enjoyed the moments of the riffraff and the lights being off and them, you know, cultivating a moment to make it a candlelight dinner moment and embracing, you know, let's, let's, embrace the fact that the lights are off but still enlighten our kids and not look down on this moment and appreciate what we have as a family even though we are struggling like those are real things that happen in real life to real people I love those moments outside of you know maybe Tony eyes with the glasses getting punched out like it seems so rushed it was just like Troy got back and then her mom was dead like immediately I just feel like I would have appreciated the story more if we could have went on a journey journey with the family entirely but you still get the gist and you still get the point and it still hurts very much so we do have you know the kids just being kids and you know watching soul train having a good old time and troy as well as the boys and the dad even though you see right away that the dad and the mom pretty much know that this is probably it you see her embrace troy as she arrives and says you know hey take care of your younger brother kind of trying to get her prepared for what she needs to do because she knows she's not going to be there much longer and you absolutely see that the dad just doesn't know what to do like he hasn't had to have the burden of taking care of everything by himself she has always been there to be that and now that she's leaving what am I going to do how am I going to raise these five kids by myself and what does that even look like and I really hate that she just didn't I mean you shouldn't because it's real life she didn't really get any closure in the end all the way to the end uh, of her being sick up until those moments that you know before they even drop Trey off at Aunt Song's house they're arguing about financial reasons he's not really even still bringing any money into the house the concert wasn't successful and she is trying her best to still be a good wife and uplift his spirits even though the entire movie we have seen her crying out for help and which she did not receive any and then she's just gone she's just dead but you know most of the time this is how things happen you don't get to you know wrap everything up in a nice little bow this is why you need to appreciate everyone while they're here especially your mother now the ending is rushed it's all about the mom passing away and the family prepping and just being in acceptance and grieving everyone pretty much outside of Troy she is very much so in denial and she is just not crying she is not having the same reaction as her brothers I love that moment so much when they had the funeral and the whole wake situation and you have Quentin finally go over and show her some affection and hold her hand when we've seen the bigger, you flat chested evil witch, you know, they're at each other's throat. I hate you, I hate you, I hate your stinking guts the entire 
entire movie, but at that moment they understand the bigger picture and how much they mean to each other as siblings. And it's just such a beautiful moment and oh, it's just so sad because it's like, damn, it just happened so abruptly. I remember um, with me rewatching it, I kind of rewound it. I was like, oh damn, I didn't miss anything. Like we just, bam, it's here and she's gone, which is probably you knowing Spike, you know, some intentional thing because that's how things happen. Deaths don't always, you know, happen slowly and long over periods of time later in life. Sometimes it's just instant and you're left to try to figure out what to do and how to move accordingly. It's such a quick moment, but yet a beautiful moment. And you really see the kids and the husband really appreciate her once she's no longer here. Now, we do in the end kind of have Spike chip away at some of that for me. I love the fact that we do, you know, get into Troy actually grieving and she vomits and they're like, you know, we're all waiting for your breakdown. It's okay to cry. She's gone. And you kind of have her take her righteous place as the woman of the house and she's looking up her older brother, breathing that scab to get that last kind of love letter from her mother to that mighty love. It's all really good wrapped up in the bow. But what always like ruined the end ending from me is when you know snuff in the glue snippers you know um trying to take little man's money and she goes out to protect him which is what her mother said to do but the whole you know thing with the bat and knocking him over the head and that whole it was just that whole surreal moment I just uh, I always hated that moment but it's you know in one of those you know intentional spike things even with you know the situation jungle fever no like why why spike why did we need that but that's why we love him because you're never going to get anything in a nice little bowl nothing's going to go in order in sequence you're going to get shock bell you're going to get what the hell is going on and you're going to love it because it's spike lee in this film is no different like uh, it's always good to go back and watch this and just get that breath of fresh air of a time that just seems non-existent it's so long gone well you guys that was my review for Cricklin I hope you enjoyed it please drop down and tell me what you thought about my review and what you think about this film and like this video this was my little uh, uh, for y'all for supporting me 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 and getting me all the way to this 5k i appreciate you guys i hope we make it to 10k really soon i see you guys for my next video bye